uh, we're very happy today to be uh, concluding the, the, the month of June, um, which has uh, included a celebration of Pride Month with a, a program uh, here today with Andrew Rimby, uh, who has spoken a, a few times before at the library. And we're certainly very happy to welcome him back. I'm just gonna give you a little background. Andrew Rimby is a PhD candidate in the English department at Stony Brook University. His dissertation, The Pool of Narcissus, Transatlantic Homoerotic Attachments from 1837 to 1901, argues that Walt Whitman, Oscar Wilde, and other 19th century writers used ancient Greek allusions to express male homoerotic desire before the term homosexuality is invented. He is a 2019 Giuliano Global Fellow, a 2019-2020 Public Humanities Fellow, and a 2019 Stony Brook Graduate Fellow in the Arts, Humanities, and Lettered Social Sciences. So please join me in welcoming Andrew Rimby. Take it away, Andrew. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff. Okay, so um, I see, I like, I have all of you on the side. That way I feel like the audience is present. Uh, so if there's any hiccup um, with the links, cause I'll be showing some video links of YouTube videos, uh, just bear with me. Um, and Jeff, you know, if it doesn't play, he'll uh, interrupt me. Uh, so um, I see some, Terry, I see you, so hello. I think my parents are on here, which is nice um, and comforting. Uh, so yeah, this is the last day of Pride, but I always say Pride is every day for me. Um, I think it's a celebration that should always exist um, to feel empowered with yourself. Uh, so I'm, right now you see the title of my talk. And Jeff did a really good job of explaining that I really work in the 19th century with Whitman and Oscar Wilde, but I really took myself out of my comfort zone. And this is really going to be a contemporary talk because I think the current moment we're in, uh, the contemporary period is so important to connect to the past and how they basically loop back together again and again. Um, so some questions I'm gonna pose to you all. Um, and, you know, use the chat option if you have any questions throughout. I'd love to, you know, engage with you all after in the chat room. Uh, so some questions I just have about thinking about literature, and this isn't just LGBTQ literature, but literature in general. Why do we open up books? So what is the power of literature? Is it about finding yourself in the narrative? Um, how does identity play a role when you're reading? Um, are you conscious when you're reading that you're creating a connection to the characters and learning the skills of empathy. Um, so as I said, I'm honored to speak to you all on the last day of Pride. Uh, during a time in America where the need to advocate for racial justice and recognizing my own privileges um, and how I can continue to be a better ally, especially to um, Black Lives Matter and to think about these intersections. And I'm gonna talk a lot about that because um, I recognize that I work on Walt Whitman and he is a very uh, prominent white poet from the 19th century. So I kind of wanted to decenter him until the end and just see you know, what that does as a presentation. Um, so I wanna remind you all that um, Pride really was initiated, ignited, you could say on June 28th at the Stonewall Inn. Um, there had been uh, sit-ins before Stonewall, um, especially in Philadelphia at uh, Compton's um, cafeteria in I think San Francisco. Um, but the Stonewall riots, as they're called, actually happened for a week. So they didn't end until July 3rd. Um, and if you opened up Google, you saw that main figure, Marsha P. Johnson. So thank goodness Google's honoring her. I think it's about time. Uh, she was a black gay liberation and transgender rights activist. Her and Sylvia Rivera, who was a Latina gay liberation and transgender rights activist, really bonded and formed the um, street transvestite organization. And th that's how they identified themselves. So I'm not using that term to identify them. Um, and they were very instrumental in fighting for queer. And if you're curious why I'm using queer, a lot of the time it's just, I think it's a helpful umbrella term to uh, talk about those who identify outside, outside of a uh, straight uh, perspective, a heterosexual perspective. Um, so Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson were fighting against police brutality. 
So, um, you know, that's very timely right now. Um, and that intersection between queer people of color and um, fighting for equal rights and to stop um, any type of police violence was front and center for queer liberation and the marches. Um, and I think that's really now back in the conversation, which is important. Um, so I feel right now, I'm not sure if all of you feel this, but there's a real historic energy in the air, um, a vibration of a movement that is recognizing the need for social and racial justice and the necessity. Um, so, okay, how do I approach this talk? I'm gonna move actually backward. So a lot of the times academics like to move forward. I always go against that. Um, I have a very queer way of even doing presentations. So we're gonna move from 2020 back to 1860. Um, and you might think it can't be done, but it'll, I'll try to do it. Um, so I'm gonna focus a lot on LGBTQ narratives that aren't just a monolithic group. So it's not just speaking for one identity. An important term that you're gonna hear a lot is intersectionality. I'll explain where that comes from. Um, but right now I'm calling myself out as a gay white man. And I think it's very important I do that because um, I have my own certain perspectives and um, experiences. So when I put together this presentation, I thought consciously about, um, you know, what were the most important current texts that have been published? And what do they say about where LGBTQ literature is right now? Right? And I can't answer that whole question, but I think we can see that um, it's not only literature, I'm also gonna talk about media too. Okay, so reading against chronology, how did we get here? Um, I always think it's important just to start with what LGBTQ means. Um, so for some of you, this might be the refresher, but I think it's always important to re-educate ourselves. Um, so it's an acronym uh, that defines lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning, or questioning. And these terms are used to describe a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, and I also shared in the chat room um, a list of the resources that I'll talk about during this talk. That way, you know, you see a text that you want to look into more, please feel free to uh, use my list. Um, okay. And I have here, it's in the list I include, it's a New York Public Library uh, resource for LGBTQ literature. Um, it was really helpful. Oh, and I also shared, I put together Andrew's 2020 Pride Month reading list. So you'll see that in the chat too. And I think to get to the chat, you just go to more and then the chat option um, on your screen. Okay. So the way I define how I read these texts, um, and this works hand in hand with my dissertation, um, I talk about, and it's really playful and it's edgy and provocative and I love that. Uh, so of course I'm gonna do it. It's called Cruising with LGBTQ Literature. Um, and there's actually two really important definitions of cruising that the Oxford English Dictionary presents. As you see, there's the formal, like when everyone says, I'm going on a cruise to the Caribbean, that's the first definition, sailing around and you don't have a precise destination in mind, but it's pleasurable. It's always pleasurable. Even if you're cruising on the highway, I'm going on the LIA. It's, well, that might not be the best example about a pleasurable cruising experience, but uh, you get my drift. Um, the informal definition is what I'm really excited about is there's an interplay between these two. And it's the action or practice of looking and wandering around in search of a casual sexual partner. So if you see in the bottom, this is one of those stock images that always stays in my mind of the um, uh, Hudson River um, pier. Uh, one of the piers on the Hudson River by West Village, um, which was a very large cruising area, um, also very large just tanning area. They had a lot of um, those who were tanning here that were part of the queer community had repurposed uh, uh, this pier. It was very dangerous because the pier was not steady and actually did collapse at certain points. 
So, um, you know, they did this with danger in mind. Um, they took their life in their hands sometimes. But I think this is a great example of just what kind of cruising place looked like in the 80s and 70s into the 80s. Um, one of my favorite books is called Times Square Red, Times Square Blue. This is where I really get this idea um, about a theory of cruising. It's by Samuel Delaney. If you haven't heard of him, please look him up. It's great. Um, he recalls, and for those of you who are New Yorkers, born and bred, or you were in Times Square in the 70s and 80s, I'm sure you have experiences that you could, you know, put upon me because my experience of Times Square is the Disney Disney-fied version. Very different. Um, and if you didn't know, Times Square had a lot of adult porn theaters um, and adult uh, porn stores. Actually, some of them still exist, um, but they're kind of being edged out by uh, the chain stores. Um, so a lot of the cruising actually happened in Times Square, and it was also a area for prostitution too. It was a red light district um, in the 70s and 80s. Okay. So, you know, why do I choose cruising? Actually, let me go back real quick. I don't want to jump ahead. So I choose cruising as a way to just explain my own identity when I'm, my reading experience, which is um, I look into LGBTQ narratives and I don't really have a specific purpose for why I'm picking up each narrative, but I do think once you bring multiple narratives into a conversation, you start to create a cohesive story, even for yourself and why you're reading in the first place. Okay, so now we're into 2020. Um, this is a link I want to show, so hopefully it does appear. Um, this was done by the Oprah Magazine. Um, and I think for the first link, um, let's see, you might have a little, Okay, can I get a thumbs up if you can see the link? Yeah, maybe I can even Jeff, I can do you see, see that? Yeah, I do see it, Andy. Good, yes. good, okay, just so now I know for the future. Oh, good, I got, okay, Terry has a thumbs up, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm not gonna go through all of this, it's in one of the resources I share, but I love it. It's um, 100 LGBTQ authors share what book changed their lives, and as you'll hear with my own narrative, and I'm sure a lot of those who are listening, you have the same experience. I love doing these library talks because it was the library that in South Jersey opened my eyes for my own identity. It was through literature. Um, so I really urge you just to explore this. I think it's a great resource. Um, and you'll have some popular authors. So Alison Bechdel, she wrote Fun Home. David Sedaris has um, a selection here. Um, so I would love for you to look at that. And then um, another one is Oprah Magazine. Um, they've been on the ball uh, for 2020. Uh, they have the 56 best LGBTQ books of 2020. So um, these are all recent. It's, there has been a growing field for LGBTQ literature. I feel like 2020 is the time for conversations that intersect all identities. It's just wonderful. So yeah, here's another great link to look at. Okay, so I've been reading Under the Rainbow, and I think it's, you might be flipped on my, the screen, but I um, love this book. It was just published two months ago, three months ago, very recent. Um, and it follows, if you know about the prom musical um, that I had the pleasure to see, it's a very similar type of narrative where you have, um, they think they're very educated liberal LGBTQ members and they try to storm a rural area and they think that they're gonna impart all this knowledge on them. Uh, very Schitt's Creek-like, um, where the wealthy family thinks they have all the answers, but they actually don't. So this is a confronting your own bias narrative. Um, and it takes place in this fictional, but yet still very real Kansas area. 
Um, it's considered the most homophobic town in the USA, the um, narrator tells us. So I'm just gonna read a little from it because I think it just sets the scene so well. Um, okay, and this comes from um, our protagonist. She says, that's right. I'm a straight 15 year old girl with moms who basically raised me like a dog show poodle to be the most perfect lesbian ever. With just the right amount of feminist theory and fall flannels and whale watching. Not that there's any whale watching here and not that my moms are even together anymore. A few weeks ago, I moved from Los Angeles with my mom, Karen, and my brother, Corey, to Big Bear, Kansas, a charming little hamlet of 10,000 people that has definitely been labeled the most homophobic town in the US. Try not to be too jealous. The most homophobic thing is for real. This huge LGBTQ nonprofit called Acceptance Across America had a whole process for how they narrowed it down. I'm gonna jump a little. Uh, finally, in an exciting experiment to see if bigots can be transformed into reasonable people, Acceptance Across America sent a task force to actually live in Big Burr a task force that my mom promptly volunteered to be the head of, which brings me to how I found myself in this classroom. It's just, it's very humorous, um, as you can tell. And um, it's so interesting because like Schitt's Creek, like the prom, there's an ever growing field of confronting your own bias of what you think homophobia is or what it looks like or where it exists or even imagining small towns as maybe not quite the um, discriminatory places that they are. Um, and, you know, does it look much better in the big city? Which I think there's a lot of conversations about, you know, discrimination exists in, for, in um, all areas, unfortunately. And how can you start to break down those walls and barriers? Um, and now that I've, I was in South Jersey, quarantining with my parents. Now I'm back in Port Jeff Village and I do my daily walks. I think it's so important that in small towns like Port Jefferson and in my parents, well, it's not a, where I grew up in South Jersey, isn't necessarily a small town, but in the suburbs, it's important that there's pride flags being shown. It shows visibility. Um, okay. So there's Under the Rainbow. Now I've also been in an audiobook uh, kick I think it's because I can only read text for so long every day. So during my walks, I start to listen to, uh, I'll do a plug for you, Jeff, uh, the Libby app on Overdrive. Um, so you can get this from um, Libby, the app that you download. It's called Here For It or How to Save Your Soul in America. Um, I see, thumbs up, okay, uh, by R. Eric Thomas. Um, it's so, oh, and he reads it, which I think is even more, um, enjoyable when the author reads their uh, book because um, you hear all the inflections and I'm actually going to have you listen to a little clip. Um, so here's our Eric Thomas explaining what his identities are like and how they intersect. Okay. I'm a Grover. I've always been black in a white environment, not black enough in a black environment. Working class in an upper class environment, Christian in a secular environment, questioning in a devout environment, gay in a straight environment. Never quite right. I grew up a little ball of potential but oblivious gay energy in a Baptist family from a black Baltimore neighborhood where there were more abandoned houses than lived in ones. My parents sent me to school in a rich suburb where most of my classmates were white. Every moment from then on, I was an other. The thing is, I felt it, but I didn't realize it. Other felt like a funhouse narrative. It felt like doing something wrong, or worse, being something wrong. So I ignored it for as long as I could, creating certainty where I could. And when that didn't work, I anxiously awaited a spoiler to burst through time and let me know if this whole thing was going to end badly. That, for a while, seemed like life. And if I was really being honest with myself, I wasn't into it. The only option was to sit in the pews every Sunday at church and casually wonder if I was going to go to hell because of who I was. No, thank you. Or to understand that the structures on which the country was built were engineered against me. Hard pass. 
What choice did I have besides constantly code switching between identities as a means of hiding in plain sight? And wasn't it just normal to feel like such a mistake as an adult that every time I walked over a bridge or stood on a subway platform, I had to talk myself out of stepping over the edge? I came to believe I was a monster and that I deserved to feel the way I felt. And I didn't want to turn the page. But through it all, there was a constant tethering me to the idea of a future. The library. The library is the place where I could borrow first Grover's philosophical tome, then a couple of choose your own adventures I could cheat at, and later a stack of mysteries I could spoil for myself. Oh, I love it. Okay. Ah, such a good book. Okay. Um, and I really urge you all to listen to audiobooks because you never know when you just need that voice in the background. Um, so intersectionality is really being highlighted here in a non-academic way, which I think is what makes it really work for a narrative. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw, um, a lawyer, coined the term intersectionality in 1989. Um, so the actual definition means the interconnected nature of social categories, race, class, gender, and how they apply to a given individual or group. I feel like um, we now hear the term intersectionality everywhere. Um, it's become very mainstream. Um, but, you know, what's really important is to see how Eric, our Eric Thomas is talking about growing up in a um, impoverished Baltimore area, but going to a very um, white privileged school district. And what does that, how is that at odds with his home life? So he's just really punny. It's very enjoyable um, and complicated and messy. And I think if nothing else, Under the Rainbow and Here for It and a lot of the narratives being published right now, they show that the LGBTQ life in America is messy. There is no one answer to it. Um, okay. So I didn't have the pleasure of seeing the original miniseries, Tales of the City. Um, I call this Finding Your Chosen Family in Tales of the City. And um, I saw this reboot that was just done in 2019. One of those Netflix binge watch shows where it just appears and I don't know where it came from, but I'm kind of curious. Um, I knew that Armistead Maupin had written the books, Tales of the City, and they'd been very popular. Here's a really beautiful view of San Francisco. Um, San Francisco becomes this magical fantasy place. Like, yes, San Francisco has a lot of um, LGBTQ visibility, but Armistead Maupin and um, the producers of this reboot said they really wanted to, um, San Francisco to be a character. Like, it's not only a setting, it's a character in the narrative, and it's also a very ideal, idealized place. Like, what does the potential of LGBTQ life look like? Um, so I'm going to have us watch the trailer. Um, I think it does a really good job of showing, um, let's see, how it's imagined in this reboot. When I first got off the bus years ago, I had the strangest feeling that I'd come home. I'll never grow up. Let's see. We might get a little interruption. Oh, there we go. Maybe I'll grow up. Be a beautiful girl. But for today, did anyone ever tell you how I came to live at Barbary Lane in the first place? I read an ad. And you know what it said? You'll know if it's right for you. There is no better reward in a person's life than to see a building turn from walls of brick to a nest of warm stories and warm hearts. <laughs> I love it so much. So if you haven't seen this reboot, you need to see it. It's just, um, 
does a really good job continuing this narrative of intergenerational LGBTQ life. So as you could even see in the trailer, there are so many intersecting lives. Those um, who are adults in San Francisco on Barbary Lane. So if you don't know, 28 Barbary, La Barbary Lane becomes this um, house that's rented out to all different LGBTQ people, but also Laura Linney, if you recognize her, her character um, is straight, but she gets adopted by this group. So it really shows you what is family. It's not always blood related. And for a lot of LGBTQ people, it can't only be blood related, it has to be expanded. Um, and just to let you know, I'm not getting any uh, promotional uh, um, incentives for promoting these uh, materials, but um, it is so well done. And um, I don't think I have time to show this next one, but if you want to see on YouTube and you look up Tales of the City 2019, it's a really good clip of the producers talking about um, why they really wanted to have tension between the generations. So what does the LGBTQ elder community, um, and for that, really those who were um, coming of age in the late 60s, 70s, into the 80s, and really lived through the devastating HIV AIDS crisis, what can they impart on the millennial, my generation, and now Gen Z? Um, you know, how can you share knowledge together? Um, because it's so important to share your stories and learn from each other. Okay, so finding myself in the text. Um, I read Call Me By Your Name before it was popular. Um, I read it before the movie came out. I read it in 2008. So Call Me By Your Name was published in 2007. Um, and I was a freshman in high school. I went to my local library and here is actually everything. Um, I did a screenshot from the library catalog. So this is what it looks like. Um, and I looked up gay fiction and I just wanted to find myself. I wanted to find what gay fiction is there. And Call Me By Your Name was the first one that came up and I read it. And I thought I had this secretive text. I was hiding it, holding it to myself. Um, I was very nervous that I would be outed by the librarians, but then I looked up that the librarians have to follow confidentiality. So um, I knew I was okay and safe in that regard. Um, so Call Me By Your Name led me to The Persian Boy by Mary Renault, um, which was another very um, canonical um, queer text. Um, and it just led me on a journey to, I think, igniting why I am here right now and why I'm so invested in uh, literature. Um, so let's just see. Okay, so the 2007 New York Times book review by Stacey D'Erasmo is just, I think it's amazing. Uh, she says, this novel is hot. <laughs> a coming of age story, a coming out story, a Proustian meditation on time and desire, a love letter, an invocation and something of an epitaph. Call Me By Your Name is also an open question. So I don't know how many of you have read Call Me By Your Name. Maybe you've seen the film uh, from 2017. Um, but I think Stacey D'Erasmo hits all of why Call Me By Your Name is such an interesting novel because it doesn't have any answer. And it's a real exploration of just raw desire. Um, young Elio is living in Italy um, he's from America, but he vacations in Italy with his father and mother because his father is a um, archaeologist who specializes in ancient Greece. Um, so he's like discovering all these artifacts. Um, and Oliver is a grad student who gets employed by his father to do research. So Elio starts to feel a lot of love and desire for Oliver. He doesn't know why. He can't put words to it, um, and a relationship starts to form between them. Um, the novel was much more controversial than the film because the novel really um, showed a ten, six year age difference, maybe. I think Elio in the novel is 16, 
um, and Oliver is 21. In the film, there's not really a lot of heightened discussion about that, I think, because, you know, Hollywood, uh, they like to not get as controversial. Um, but that this was even released widely, um, I saw it in New York City at the Paris Cinema, which I think isn't open anymore, which is sad, but it was an experience. And um, I'm gonna show you one of my favorite um, moments is where, let me just pull it up because it might take some time to load. Um, let's see if I can just pause it real quick. Okay. Oh, and there's a commercial. Huh. Okay, let's see. Okay, good. Okay, I'll let that load. Um, so a little backstory, I won't give too much of the plot away. Um, Elio is played by Timothy Chalamet, who's very popular now. He was in Little Women recently, um, very good actor. Um, and Oliver is played by Army Hammer. Um, and so not only do they start to bond because they're in love with each other um, and they experience the same feelings towards one another, but Oliver starts to empower Elio to accept his Jewish identity because Elio had been hiding his Jewish identity in Italy. And the reason is because in Italy in the 80s, uh, being Jewish is not very accepted or very open. Um, you know, there's not a lot of Jewish representation. So it's also a really interesting gay Jewish love story dynamic going on. Um, and it really comes from Andre Asaman, the author's experiences. Um, okay, so here's the clip. I think I can do full screen. That way you can see it all. Yeah, okay. And just know even the setting of this film, like how all the buildings, it was all filmed on location in Northern Italy. I think which is also why I love this film is uh, how everything looks. Um, it's aesthetically really um, pleasing. Oliver. Tell anyone. Trouble. Are you happy I came here? I could kiss you if I could. Okay. So if you notice, what also is really interesting is they can openly talk about their feelings with one another because there's a language barrier. So those around them don't understand English. So they actually start to use English as a way to communicate too. Um, really interesting um, narrative that starts to happen and express, you know, where do you feel comfortable expressing your uh, sexuality even? Um, I don't want to ruin the ending because it's very... Uh, you know, it's not quite pleasing on the audience, but which is important. It's a really complicated story about who's ready to maybe accept their identity and maybe who feels that they can't because of their social circumstances. Um, I do want to show you a little of um, Elio's father um, gives a monologue um, describing his acceptance for his son's desire towards Oliver, um, because he knows that there is an infatuation and a love interest there. Um, let's see. And I'm just going to cut it off shortly. Right now, you may not want to feel anything. Maybe you never wanted to feel anything. And, uh, Maybe it's not to me you'll want to speak about these things, but um, feel something you obviously did. 
Look, you had a beautiful friendship. Maybe more than a friendship. And I envy you. My place, most parents would hope the whole thing goes away. Pray their sons land on their feet, but I am not such a parent. We rip out so much of ourselves to be cured of things faster that we go bankrupt by the age of 30 and have less to offer each time we start with someone new. But to make yourself feel nothing so as not to feel anything. What a waste. Okay. So basically, um, and my parents are on right now, and they've been so supportive. This is, this is the type of parent you want. I mean, this is the conversation you want to have of acceptance. Um, and again, this is why the, the film is so well done and the novel. It, the father is really empowers his son. Um, it's Oliver who has a different reaction for the future of their relationship. And uh, there's a sequel now too called Find Me and they're gonna make a sequel for the film um, with the same actors. So it's exciting. Um, okay, this leads me now, we're moving back in time. Um, I shared with you on the queer resources. I love listening to uh, Pride Radio and there is some really good playlists going on right now. Um, and one of them, it is probably the most famous Pride anthem is I'm Coming Out. Um, some backstory. Um, well, I got to see Diana Ross with my mom a few years ago in Philly. That was amazing. Um, and she always opens her show with the song. Um, I call it queer coding because Diana Ross didn't know that I'm Coming Out was related to the LGBTQ community. It was her producers. It was actually um, Chic who produced I'm Coming Out for Diana Ross. And they were in LGBTQ bars in Greenwich Village and they heard that phrase and they're the ones who decided to use that for Diana Ross. When Diana Ro Ross heard about it and she knew then where it came from, she was very angry at first. Um, and she admits it. She says she was angry because she thought her music career was over and they were humiliating her because um, she had just split from Motown Records. And this is 1980. Um, disco is at an all time um, low because it's really being stigmatized. And the reason is because disco is a space for LGBTQ people, people of color, um, female empowerment. It is the place where uh, people go to just release and um, come together. However, Diana Ross goes through with the song and she starts to realize that she be has become a gay icon. Now she embraces that gay icon uh, status. Um, but there was a complicated relationship to it. And I think it also shows that artists, they can evolve. Um, and the same is true of Donna Summer in a way too. She became a huge icon, but she also was resistant to her queer audience. Um, so this journey is fascinating that the music industry goes through. Um, I have to show you the opening in Central Park when she did I'm Coming Out because um, I'll show you just a little. I love this song. I could play it over and over again. Um, so let's see. It's also, it's also the performance in Central Park where it poured rain on her and she kept going um, because that's what she does. Thank you. 
Okay, I love that clip. Um, also, just look at the mass number of people and how young they are and how they're of all different races. It just, um, and I also have to tell you, the more I've looked into I'm Coming Out's history, the more I actually have found Diana Ross talking about she was in gay bars. So she does admit that she was part of the LGBTQ community in a way. She just didn't want to um, align herself outwardly with the LGBTQ community because um, she was afraid of her commercial success. But as you can see, uh, her fans embraced her. Um, it's just amazing. Okay, also she rocks that leotard. Um, okay, now I'm jumping back to both contemporary and the past. So this leads into starting to conclude the talk, which is my last section on E.M. Forster's Morris, um, a novel I read as an undergrad. It was so interesting because it was written in 1913 and features such an openly gay love story between the protagonist Morris and his um, uh, game, I think they call it a Gamecock um, uh, cottage landscaper. It's a gardener. There's a very different social class uh, relationship going on here. And um, E.M. Forster wrote it in 1913, but he actually doesn't publish it during his lifetime because he is afraid of being censored. Um, because he's from England and England had very strict censorship rules about um, what they called obscene literature. And sadly, that's what his novel fell under. Um, I'll get into a little more about that publication in the next slide. So I had the chance to see The Inheritance. I now have the book of the two parts of the play. Um, if you don't know, The Inheritance is a two-part play um, being compared to Angels in America, except um, it's very intergenerational. So it really takes place about the millennial generation of LGBTQ, uh, New York City or New York City um, um, residents and their conversations um, with the baby boomer generation. Um, but specifically, what's interesting is E.M. Forster is a main character in the play. So he like comes in as a fantasy character and he um, introduces at all of us, the audience, um, to these young men. So there are 10 young men in the prologue and um, they're trying to write a story about their life, but they don't know where to start. So who do they turn to but E.M. Forster? Um, it is seven hours. I did not see both parts in the same day because that was intense, but it was worth it. Um, very, very um, emotional of an experience. Um, and I'm not going to show the clip, but Matthew Lopez, who actually I found out is the nephew of Priscilla Lopez, who, if you know, she was the, in the original chorus line. Um, so there's a huge theater background there. Um, and I think I just love how the Rolling Stones, they called it an emotional powerhouse, a ravishing theatrical work that urges generations to connect and love. Um, and you really get that from uh, seeing the play. Um, but now that, you know, sadly we can't uh, see theater, the book is available. So definitely um, read the play. Um, okay, so this I call the deception theme. Uh, section of LGBTQ literature. So Morris, yes, they're openly, he's openly gay, but there's also always the fear that he's going to be found out and his career is going to be ruined as this aristocratic, educated man. Um, very popular type of literature happening um, from 19, I'd say 1900 until even 1970, 1960. Um, it gets published um, in the 1970s when he passes away. Um, and it actually is published by Christopher Isherwood, who wrote Goodbye Berlin, which was the basis for Cabaret. So all of these communities, it's so interesting how they work in, together. 
Okay. And the narrator reflects on Morris and Alec's love. Um, and he says about Alec, was he educating Morris or was his spirit educating Morris's spirit? For they themselves became equal. Neither thought, am I led, am I leading? Um, and the novel doesn't end in death. And I say that because a lot of novels, queer novels of the early 20th century ended in a death. E.M. Forster said he didn't publish it, not only because it was about two men being in love, but because they didn't die. And apparently that was the most objectionable as they weren't dying. Um, so shows you a lot about America's homophobic history. Um, and it's a really interesting novel. The film version is good too. Um, Hugh Grant's in it. It leads me into Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin, a figure who now more than ever, I think we need to read a lot of. Um, and he wrote Giovanni's Room semi-based on his experiences. Uh, James Baldwin left America um, to go to Paris um, in the 50s because he couldn't handle the racism in America anymore. So he becomes an expat and he writes Giovanni's Room from Paris and um, David, the protagonist, uh, gets into this affair with Giovanni, who's an Italian bartender and uh, hence the title. But Giovanni's Room, unlike Morris, does have a lot of that psychological deception. Um, it has sadly a murder, um, and there is this self-doubting nature that David keeps having about his own identity, that he thinks he is um, perverse. So um, very different novels, but also they start, they follow that deceptive theme. Okay. So there is a really interesting, huge um, recognition moment for David. So this section in the novel is where David really finds out about his own identity. Um, and he comes out internally. Um, he says, for I am or I was one of those people who pride themselves on their willpower, on their ability to make a decision and carry it through. Um, so I'll just show you here. He says, people who believe that they are strong-willed and the masters of their destiny can only continue to believe this by becoming specialists in self-deceptions. Uh, deception. Their decisions are not really decisions at all. A real decision makes one humble. One knows that it is at the mercy of more things that can be named. On and on. Okay, so he's really questioning this whole time. Um, but I think we also have to recognize uh, James Baldwin actually published this novel. E.M. Forster didn't publish his novel. So, you know, it took a lot for James Baldwin to put himself out there. Um, especially as a gay black man uh, writing in the 1950s. Okay. Edward Carpenter and E.M. Farster. If you don't know who Edward Carpenter is, you're going to learn soon. Edward Carpenter is actually the one who E.M. Farster models Morris on. It's Edward Carpenter. Um, and Edward Carpenter on the left had a relationship with George Merle, Merle on the right. George Merle was from a lower working class English background. Edward Carpenter was from an aristocratic background. So they become more, uh, Forster's models um, for how he's going to write Morris. Um, and as you see here, here's a little um, snippet of a letter that George Merrill's writing in 1887 to Edward Carpenter. He said, yes, Ted, that's his pet name for Edward. Um, it did help me a great deal that talk that we had in bed that Monday morning um, you know, I'm so, thankfully we have these letters. Um, I don't keep all my letters, so I don't know. People, I guess, will look at our texts that we sent. Um, but George Merrill openly talks about their sexual encounters in bed and these conversations they're having together. It's really interesting history, um, right? And we're already, now we're back to 1887. So you can see there is an openness being talked about their same-sex encounters. It's not like it doesn't exist, right? Okay, so this painting on the right, being from the Philly area, I love to hype it up. It's by Thomas Eakins. 
um, who actually does Walt Whitman's portrait. Um, he lived in Philly. It's called The Swimming Hole. It's based on Walt Whitman's poem, um, Song of Myself. There's a section with bathers, the 28 bathers. This is Eakins' interp interpretation of it. Um, Edward Carpenter was a socialist, and he takes Whitman's poetry further. Whitman is not a socialist. Um, I think we could argue he might be a poetic socialist, but that's different than a on the ground type of political reformer. Edward Carpenter writes a book called Towards Democracy in 1905. And I have to keep reminding myself, I can't believe like this material actually exists. Um, kind of similar to Emma Goldman in a way, if you know about Emma Goldman, um, who was also a very large socialist reformer. Um, he urged for female empowerment. He believed in a strong labor movement that needed unions and he had an openness towards same-sex love. Um, he calls the homosexual a Uranian, which is an ancient Greek slippage uh, from the god U Uranus. Um, and Uranian had been coined by a sexologist named Ulrichs in 1864, who said a Uranian is a man who has a female psyche in a male body which, you know, we could talk about, you know, is this a beginning of understanding uh, non-binary gender? What's going on here? But it's a real, it was a way for Edward Carpenter. He also really thinks about um, men who desire other men and women who desire other women as maybe having um, gender non-conforming um, attitudes and ideas. Um, so it's a really interesting, uh, theory and framework. Um, but what is most Whitmanic about Edward Carpenter is he uses Whitman's poetry to talk about what democracy is. And he says democracy needs same-sex love in order to function. And um, it's what makes him very indebted to ancient Greece and an understanding about same-sex love in ancient Greece. And yeah, there's problems in ancient Greece. There's a lot of inequalities in ancient Greece. Um, but they thought ancient Greece was uh, where it was at for same-sex love. That was their um, model. Um, and it was for Whitman. That's actually what I write about in my dissertation, is Whitman was more interested in ancient Greece than a lot of scholars like to admit, or even look into. Um, OK. So. John Addington Simmons is our last real big figure. He um, uses Whitman, um, Whitman's poetry as an actual um, case study. So he uses Whitman to define what a homosexual is. It's a really interesting, and I shared the resource with you if you want to read a little of it. Um, it is medical in the sense that it's sexology, so it's the study of sexuality. Um, John Addington Simmons was one of the first sexologists in England, but he uses literature to explain who a homosexual is, what they look like, and he thinks that Whitman's poetry is ripe for all of this. Whitman doesn't necessarily agree. That's a different story. Um, but this is what Simmons says about Leaves of Grass, um, Whitman's biggest, well, Whitman's um, collection of poetry. It's called Leaves of Grass throughout his life. He just keeps adding to it. Um, he's, Simmons writes, a great personality of recent times, widely regarded with reverence as the prophet poet of democracy, Walt Whitman has aroused discussion by his sympathetic attitude toward passionate friendship or manly love, as he calls it, in Leaves of Grass. Um, John Addington Simmons and Walt Whitman had a very long friendship in letters. They wrote back and forth. Whitman really respected John Addington Simmons. However, John Addington Simmons kept asking Whitman, what does your poetry mean about same-sex love? You need to explain it to me. You need to define it for me. Simmons kept trying to box Whitman into a category. He wanted Whitman to admit that, yes, my poetry is homosexual poetry. Whitman refused. He writes this in 1890, two years before his death. 
he says about the questions on calamus and calamus is a certain section very homoerotically charged in leaves of grass um and he says they quite daze me leaves of grass is only to be rightly construed by and with its own atmosphere and essential character um that the calamus part has ever allowed the possibility of such construction as mentioned is terrible I am fain to hope that the pages themselves are not to be even mentioned for such gratuitous and quite at the time undreamed and unwished possibility of morbid inferences, um, which are disavowed. Uh, let me see. Oh, just have to move it. Uh, I can't read the last section, but, um, oh, I see, which are disavowed by me and uh, seem damnable. Um, so, I think that Whitman, this is only two years before he dies, and he finally answers Simmons's question. I think it's because he wants to preserve his image for his public, for his readership. He doesn't want to be seen as a homosexual poet um, for years to come. However, he's seen now as one of the first very openly LGBTQ writers. So, you know, an author, an artist like Diana Ross, they're not always in charge of how people respond to them. Um, so it's another real interesting way of how sometimes a writer really wants to preserve how they're seen by their public. Um, it reminds me of Margaret Atwood and when she gets the question of, is The Handmaid's Tale a feminist novel? And she says, no, no, it's not feminist. Um, it might contain those themes, but I'm not a feminist writer. However, um, I think we can see there's a lot of feminist themes in The Handmaid's Tale. Um, sometimes you don't always look to the writer to define their work. Um, okay. And I'm going to end on this slide. Whitman's City of Orgies, to search for queer potential in Whitman. Um, he has a poem called City of Orgies. Yes, I didn't make that up. Um, from 1860. It is very homoerotic. Um, let me just see. I'm going to read it to you. It's short. Um, and the last line of it I love is called, uh, lovers, continual lovers only repay me. Okay. So this is city of orgies. Um, and I shared with you leaves of grass. So you can look at the calamus section. Um, I think it's just, I also need to look to see if someone's done an audio version of it. Um, if the, what the audiobook looks like. I'd be curious. Um, if not, maybe we all can get together and do an audiobook version of Leaves of Grass. Okay. City of orgies walks and joys. City whom that I have lived and sung in your midst will one day make you illustrious. Not the pageants of you, not your shifting tableaus, your spectacles repay me, not the interminable rows of your houses, nor the ships at the wharves, nor the processions in the streets, nor the bright windows with goods in them, nor to converse with learned persons or bear my share in the soiree or feast, not those, but as I pass, O Manhattan, your frequent and swift flash of eyes offering me love, offering response to my own, these repay me, lovers, Continual lovers only repay me. Talk about cruising. It's in this poem. And who is the speaker cruising with? Not all the men. No, no, the speaker is cruising with Manhattan. Uh, so the city, again, becomes personified in a sexual way. So tales of the city like um, cruising uh, is in all of these texts. Um, and as you can see, the circle keeps going back and around and around again. Um, and I put the pride flag here. I love this version of the pride flag. It was done in Philly um, by an artist. And it includes also um, queer people of color and the transgender rights flag. So I think it's a great way of incorporating